In the borders of the modern-day nation of Czechia, also known as the Czech Republic, lie two ancient nations of Bohemia and Moravia. Bohemia contained the city of Prague, and there a man by the name of Jan Hus, sometimes anglicized as John Hus, became a teacher at the university there in 1398. Hus was a defender of the ideas of the recently deceased dissident Catholic priest John Wycliffe, even translating and distributing some of Wycliffe's works from English into the Bohemian language, now known as Czech. What Hus taught, including protests against indulgences, advocating for married priests, and having the liturgy in the language of the people, angered many in the Catholic Church, and he faced imprisonments and trials and spent the last week of his life imprisoned in a Franciscan monastery. He was condemned by the Council of Constance, and on July 6, 1415, he was executed on this justification by the civil government by being burned at the stake. The Bohemian people reacted negatively to the execution of Hus, leading to what was called the Hussite Wars, with followers of Hus fighting against military forces of the Holy Roman Empire and other Catholic loyalists. In 1420, Pope Martin V issued a papal bull authorizing the execution of all supporters of Hus and Wycliffe, but the wars continued for another 17 years. 42 years after Hus's death in 1457, a group of the remaining followers of Hus formed what was called the Bohemian Brethren, or Unity of the Brethren, and in 1467 they received Episcopal ordination from another long-standing dissenting group, the Waldensians. By the mid-1500s, as many of 90% of those in Bohemia followed this form of Protestantism. However, from the middle of the 1500s to the 1620s, a series of events led to the suppression and death of the majority of those in the unity of the brethren. Royalty that was staunchly Catholic came into control. Jesuit priests came to the country and opened Catholic schools and eventually forced the closing of Protestant ones. The Thirty Years' War broke out and the Bohemian Protestants were defeated throughout. Plagues and disease also played their part, and in 1622, 27 remaining important Bohemian landowners were executed publicly in Prague and their lands given to Catholic loyalists. By the following year, all of the Protestant schools were closed. In 1629, the Bohemian Brethren were told that they could leave the controlled area of the Holy Roman Empire, including Bohemia and Moravia, or they could convert to Catholicism. As a result, the unity of the Brethren either went underground or scattered. In Latin, unity of the Brethren is unitas fratrum, a name still used today. 100 years later in 1722, a German nobleman named Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf received a request from an itinerant Lutheran missionary, hymn writer, and carpenter named Christian David, asking that he might allow persecuted Protestants from Moravia to settle on his lands and enjoy religious freedom. Zinzendorf agreed, and a city called Hernhut was established for this purpose. Things didn't go well, however, and by five years later in 1727, the city contained belligerent factions who fought over religious disagreements. But suddenly, there was a time of revival that changed everything. Moravian.org says of it, Then, on August 13, 1727, during a Holy Communion service at the Lutheran Parish Church in Bethelsdorf, the members of the Hernet community experienced a profound movement of spiritual renewal and reconciliation. It was like an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which manifested itself in that, as one person observed, we learned to love one another. For this reason, the day is considered the spiritual birthday of the renewed Unitas Fratrum. It also has been called the Moravian Pentecost, although there were no signs of ecstatic or extraordinary spiritual manifestations. The modern Moravian Church, or Unitas Fratrum, comes from this group of people who shortly thereafter began missionary work, something that Moravians became well known for. Peter Vogt, writing in The Hinge, a Moravian theological journal that ceased publication in 2020, says, As we consider the concept of Moravian identity from a historical point of view, we must deal with one critical question. How is the modern Moravian church linked to the history of the ancient unity? This question has been asked and answered by a number of historians with very different results. David Schatt Schneider, former dean of Moravian Theological Seminary, once proposed to think of the relationship between the ancient unity and the renewed Moravian church in terms of continuity and change. Elements of continuity are found in the personal witness of Moravian exiles and the transmission of clerical orders. Change is apparent in the approach to theology, the understanding of the bishop's office, and the intentional ethnic diversity. In contrast to Schatz Schneider, the British historian W. R. Ward has described the character of the 18th century Moravian community as a mixture of competing and contradictory claims of identity, which existed side by side. Zinzendorf and the Moravian Brethren were presenting themselves variably as an ancient church and as 
Wisconsin interconfessional movement, while outsiders often saw their community as an entirely new denomination. Even more pointed is the view that Enrico Molnar, an American historian of Czech background, presented in his article, The Pious Fraud of Count Zinzendorf. Molnar maintains that, constitutionally, the renewed Moravian Church of Count Zinzendorf has nothing in common with the old Unitas Fratrum of Bohemia. Today, the North American Church's website calls the Moravian Church the oldest Protestant church. The various Moravian provinces from over 40 countries send representatives to meet every seven years in the Unity Synod. The 1957 meeting resulted in the production of a statement called The Ground of the Unity, later modified in 1995, and which serves as a central doctrinal statement for the church today. The Church Order of the Worldwide Church says of creeds and confessions, the Unitas Fratrum recognizes in the creeds of the church the thankful acclaim of the body of Christ. These creeds aid the church in formulating a scriptural confession, in marking the boundary of heresies, and in exhorting believers to an obedient and fearless testimony in every age. The Unitas Fratrum maintains that all creeds formulated by the Christian church stand in need of constant testing in the light of the Holy Scriptures. It acknowledges as such true professions of faith the early Christian witness, Jesus Christ is Lord, and also especially the ancient Christian creeds and the fundamental creeds of the Reformation. In the various provinces of the renewed Unitas Fratrum, the following creeds in particular gain special importance, because in them, the main doctrines of the Christian faith find clear and simple expression. The Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Confession of the Unity of the Bohemian Brethren of 1535, the 21 Articles of the Unaltered Augsburg Confession, the Shorter Catechism of Martin Luther, the Synod of Bern of 1532, the 39 Articles of the Church of England, the Theological Declaration of Barman of 1934, the Heidelberg Catechism. The Moravian Covenant for Christian Living says, We decline to determine as binding what the scriptures have left undetermined, or to argue about mysteries impenetrable to human reason. In this regard, we hold to the principle in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity. Moravian professor Craig Atwood wrote on the North American Church's website, From the beginning of the Moravian Church, we have distinguished between essentials, ministerials, and incidentals. One way to understand the essentials is to think about what it was like to be a member of the Unitas Fratrum five centuries ago. If the Inquisition imprisoned your bishop, burned your Bibles, closed your church building, and prevented you from having baptism or Holy Communion, could you still be Christian? If you were a missionary and shipwrecked in the Caribbean and had no Bible or communion set, could you still preach the good news of Christ? If so, then none of those things are essential. However, if the members of a church do not demonstrate faith, love, and hope, can you call that a Christian church? For the Moravians, true Christianity is not based on a certain creed or doctrine. It is grounded in the living experience of faith in Christ, active love for others, and joyful hope. There are the essential things, God creates, God redeems, God blesses, and we respond in faith, in love, and in hope. Everything else in the church, whether it is the study of scripture or the waters of baptism, whether it is the music of angels or the gurgling praise of God on the lips of babies, whether it is profound sermons or a quiet prayer for someone in pain, should be grounded in these essentials. One American church says, Essentials, Christ as Savior is the one big essential, Baptism, communion, the Trinity are other essentials to the Moravian faith, non-essentials, variety of worship forms, musical selections, clergy styles, the manner of baptism, method of communion are all non-essentials at the heart of our liberty in the faith. We go beyond tolerance to acceptance of diversity. One interesting aspect of the Moravian Church is that they have often omitted the filioque clause in the Nicene Creed. For example, in their hymnal and liturgies of the Moravian Church published in 1969, making them one of the few Protestant denominations to do so. A 1784 Moravian book says of the Holy Spirit, He proceedeth from the Father and is sent by Christ. Although in this video I will sometimes reference Moravian provinces other than the American ones, most information online today in English comes from the American provinces, as shown in this map by cartographer Wesley Jones, and so this video should be mainly seen as an overview of the American parts of the church. The majority of Moravians today are in Tanzania and East Africa, and they are more evangelical and conservative on many areas from the mainline church body that the Moravian provinces in America have become. We'll also refer to historical statements, but this is primarily a look at what the Moravians are today, 
more than what they used to be in the past. On core Christian theology, the Moravian Church affirms the following as quoted from their Easter liturgy. We believe in the one only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who created all things by Jesus Christ and was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. We believe in God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, who has rescued us from the power of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, who has blessed us in Christ with all spiritual blessings, who has made us worthy to share in the inheritance of the saints, having destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of God's will to the praise of his glorious grace. We believe in the only Son of God, by whom all things in heaven and on earth were created. We believe that he became flesh and lived among us, taking the form of a servant. Since we are flesh and blood, he himself became a human being. By the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, he was conceived of the Virgin Mary. He was born of a woman, and being found in human form, was in every respect tempted as we are, yet without sin. To all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gives power to become children of God. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in the same way as he was seen going into heaven. The Moravian Church recognizes the sacraments of baptism and of Holy Communion. Baptism can be by immersion, pouring, or sprinkling. The 1995 Unity Synod noted that some provinces had persons baptized as infants requesting adult baptism, stating, Some persons seek a second baptism, particularly with a desire for immersion and as a personal faith response. The result was a rejection of such practices, stating that they wanted to avoid the appearance of sanctioning rebaptism and and affirm the legitimacy of infant baptism. The North America website says, Customarily in the Unitas Fratrum, children are baptized and later received by confirmation into the communicant membership. Moravian.org says of communion, The Moravian Church does not try to define the mystery of Christ's presence in the communion elements, but recognizes that the believer participates in a unique act of covenant with Christ as Savior and with other believers in Christ. Most Moravian congregations use individual cups rather than a chalice. Many congregations use grape juice rather than wine. Following the words, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. All communicants partake of the cup together, holding it through the silent prayer that follows in order to avoid distracting noises. The cup may then be placed in a pew rack. The church order says, As a matter of principle, the Moravian church maintains an open communion, welcoming the presence and participation of members of other Christian churches in the celebration of the sacrament. An order of service on moravian.org lists a Him with right hand of fellowship near the beginning and end of the communion service and says, During the right hand of fellowship, a hand clasp is extended by the communicant to his or her neighbors. As the distribution of the bread begins, all are seated except those in the first group of pews or seats. These stand until each communicant has been served and they are then seated. As the elements are brought to the next group of pews or seats, its occupants stand and are served, and so it continues until the entire congregation has been served. The Moravian.org website also mentions rites, saying, The rites of the Moravian Church are confirmation, marriage, and ordination. Celebration of the rites follows a liturgical form set forth in the hymnal. They are means of affirming the Christian faith and of dedicating oneself to a way of life consistent with that faith. The clergy are trained and set apart to administer these rites as servants of God and ministers of the church. The church has other traditional practices, including that of the love feast, of which the church order says, There is no set form for this service, but the characteristic features are the singing of hymns, addresses on some topic appropriate to the occasion, and the serving of a simple meal. Another traditional practice is the cup of covenant, which may not be practiced in all churches, but which the church order speaks of, saying, The cup of covenant is a liturgical usage of the Moravian church, which is, however, not a sacrament and must not be confused with the Holy Communion. A celebration of the Cup of Covenant may be held whenever the members of the congregation wish to strengthen themselves anew for the service of their common Lord. The practice of this involves passing around a cup of wine or grape juice during the singing of hymns. 
White wine was often used in the past to distinguish it from the Lord's Supper. If still practiced today, a common time to do so is on or around September 16th, the festival for the servants of the church. The Moravian Catechism lists the Bible canon as 66 books. The church also publishes Moravian daily texts, which are portions of the Bible for study and encouragement. The UK website speaks of this, saying, The practice of having a biblical text as a shared daily watchword among the inhabitants at Hernhut began in 1722. At that time, it was taken house to house by word of mouth to serve as a common guide to meditation and conduct. This is how it was for eight years until for 1731, a series of texts was printed for the full year, with the texts supplemented by hymn verses. So began the tradition, which is continued in this, the 293rd edition. The Old Testament texts are chosen by lot, and a New Testament text is then added. This process takes place annually in Hernhut on behalf of the worldwide Unitas Fratrum, and from there the texts are distributed to each province to be reproduced in a form suited to local needs. In November 2011, the Interprovincial Faith and Order Commission of the Moravian Church developed a statement titled, Guiding Principles of Biblical Interpretation. Some of what is said in the statement includes, Scripture is the sole standard of the doctrine and faith of the Unitas Fratrum, and therefore shapes our life. But just as the Holy Scripture does not contain any doctrinal system, so the Unitas Fratrum also has not developed any of its own, because it knows that the mystery of Jesus Christ, which is attested to in the Bible, cannot be comprehended completely by any human mind or expressed completely in any human statement. It also states, We do not believe that Jesus points us to Scripture so much that we can find the answers there, but rather that the Scripture points us to Jesus so that we can find the answers in Him. And faithful interpretation acknowledges the historical context out of which the texts arose, the contemporary culture and global context out of which questions of interpretation arise, including scientific, archaeological, and other forms of knowledge. Even with shared principles of interpretation, we realize that individuals, congregations, and provinces of the Moravian Church may draw different conclusions. In his 1902 address, Essentials of the Christian Faith, Moravian theologian Augustus Scholz said, Opinions may differ as to the infallibility or inerrancy of the Bible, history, prophecy, and doctrine, as to the possibility or desirability of harmonizing certain biblical narratives with the declarations of science and of reason, as to the mode and degree of inspiration that is conceded to one or the other part of these sacred scriptures. Affirmation of evolution, including human evolution, is common and not particularly controversial for North American Moravians today. Reverend Dr. Nelson Rivera, Associate Professor of Theology at Moravian Theological Seminary, wrote in the Hinge Journal in spring 2020, As I see it, evolutionary theory is not necessarily incompatible with religious belief. Darwinian evolution challenges traditional theism, normally defined as the belief in one God who is transcendent and yet personal and who creates and preserves all things, by stating that there is no discernible purpose in nature, at least not one discernible through the means of science. In this view, natural explanations suffice to understand the workings of the material order of things. Therefore, no manipulation of a creator is necessary. No need for a micromanager, as we would say today. Darwin's common sense has brought our attention down here to earth where we belong. Most importantly, when the theory is properly assessed, it becomes quite a corrective to human arrogance, as well as to any religion that forgets where our place is, down here with every other creature. In this sense, the theory could be said to be able to contribute to a spiritual, if not a religious, view of how things really are, us included. In the same edition, Dennis Fort, a Moravian music director, wrote, I know that evolution is now well accepted and supported with overwhelming evidence. Science and religion are not in conflict. They are complementary. They represent two very different and ultimately imperfect and incomplete ways of understanding the Creator. 2009 Unity Synod said in part, We believe that God created and continues to create the whole universe, sustains and nurtures creation, through Christ wills to redeem the whole of creation from its bondage to decay, entrust creation to our care, calling us to be stewards of it, calls us to be partners in God's ongoing creative, renewing, and redeeming activity, commands us to act justly and in righteousness not only toward our fellow human beings but to all creation, requires us to care for creation so that future generations whom God also loves can enjoy it and benefit from it. In the statement on humanity and sin, in the Moravian Catechism, it reads, God created humanity in God's own image to glorify and enjoy God forever. We are created to be pure and sinless. However, we lose this state by yielding to sin and disobeying the will of God. Sin separates people from God, others, and even self. 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. An English translation of the Bohemian Confession of 1575 says that Christ was the redeeming sacrifice not only for original sin, but also for all other sins that people commit. This document has no standing in the church today, and Moravian understandings of original sin vary. Arthur Freeman, in the Journal of Ecumenical Studies, wrote the article, Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, an ecumenical pioneer, and said of him, Zinzendorf understood that in the historic event of the cross, the effects of original sin were cared for, as was the control of the devil over humanity. These two primary existential realities that humanity faces no longer impact the nature of those born into the world. This means that children are no longer born bearing the consequences of original sin, nor are they born automatically into the control of Satan. The Moravian Catechism says on redemption, In order to be released from the deeper human condition of sin, we rely on the grace of God given to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We call Jesus Redeemer because it is through him that we claim salvation which frees us from sin in this life and calls us into abundant life both now and forever. The Moravian Church does not have a one-size-fits-all view on conversion or salvation. There is no standardized Moravian presentation on the way of descriptions on how to get to heaven. Referring to a bishop and early leader of the Unitas Fratrum, Luke of Prague, Moravian.org says, According to Moravian teaching, six things are essential. God creates, and God's creation is good. God redeems, God blesses, and we respond by having faith in what God has done and is doing, by loving God, loving ourselves, loving our neighbors, and loving our enemies, and looking to the future with hope because we know we will be with God. Luke of Prague disagreed with Martin Luther, who said that we are justified by faith alone. Our church taught that faith cannot be separated from love and hope. If you claim to have faith in Christ but do not love others, Luke told Luther, then you do not really have faith. Moravian professor Craig Atwood said in a 2011 lecture, Well into the 19th century, Moravian's theology centered on the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross as the atonement for human sins. This, of course, is fairly traditional Christian teaching, but the Moravians were unusual in the intensity of their devotion to the crucified Son of God. From the mid-1730s until the 1800s, they focused much of their religious devotions on the wounds that Jesus suffered during his passion. In a 2003 lecture, he also said, It is consistent with the Christian tradition and Moravian theology to acknowledge that salvation remains one of God's mysteries. Does it mean that we lose our motivation for missions if we acknowledge that God may save people who have not made a profession of faith in Jesus? It has not had that effect in the past. The most heroic period of Moravian missions was an era when the mystery of salvation was acknowledged. We affirm strongly the biblical teaching that God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. We believe that God's redemption is an objective reality that does not depend on our response. We recognize that our knowledge is partial, our motives are tainted by sin, and our love less generous than God. We hold fast to the teaching that God can do more than we imagine. There is no rigid view on baptismal regeneration, and on salvation theology, Moravians have a spectrum with those who look very Arminian, others Lutheran, and others Pietist. There is not some strict requirement or theological system. Moravians were, however, one of the earliest groups to send missionaries, and by the year 1784, there was produced a how-to manual for mission work, later translated to English, Instructions for the Members of the Unitas Fratrum Who Minister in the Gospel Among the Heathen. The book says, Everyone, as a lost and condemned sinner without Christ, turns in faith to Jesus Christ, who has atoned for our sins, endured the chastisement due to us, and paid our debts, and receives from him power to become a child of God, when the forgiveness of sins peace with God, a childlike access to him, and the communion of the Holy Ghost is granted unto him through Christ. After the development of the Methodist movement, Methodists and Moravians have influenced each other at various times. However, Moravians have not generally affirmed the doctrine of entire sanctification, though, as with many other areas of theology, it's not considered an essential one way or the other. In their Easter liturgy, the Church affirms the role of the Holy Spirit to allot gifts to each person individually. The 2009 Unity Synod stated, Whereas issues of the charismatic movement have been divisive within the unity for some years now, whereas Unity Synod recognizes the need for continued and further discussion of matters relating to the charismatic movement, whereas the Standing Committee on Theology has spent some significant time in discussion of these matters, and whereas the Church and individual believers are the work of the Holy Spirit and possess gifts of the Holy Spirit, be it resolved that, while the Unity Synod recognizes the presence of the gifts of the Holy Spirit within the Church, it does not recognize the position that individual believers must experience or manifest specific spiritual gifts or manifestations 
manifestations of the Holy Spirit, such as, for example, speaking in tongues in order to be a Christian. The province in Czechia said in a 2020 paper on the charismatic movement, As a province, we have been and still are labeled by some as charismatics, although we do not identify with the charismatic movement ourselves. However, we have experience with charismatic manifestations. We allowed ourselves to be enriched by the charismatic movement, but we did not accept and do not want to accept what we found in it to be unhealthy. After the fall of communism, when we taught in churches about the responsibility of members in giving, it was used as one of the proofs that we are charismatic. Is tithing really a manifestation of the charismatic movement? Or clapping to the beat while singing or raising hands, praying for the sick, etc.? After all, these practices are common in many provinces of world unity, which in no way consider them Pentecostal or charismatic elements. The province says that it stands unequivocally in favor of the 2009 Unity Synod statement just quoted. They also said, A completely tragic distortion appearing in the charismatic movement is the so-called prosperity theology, which declares that God's will for everyone is to be rich. We perceive this as a clear violation of God's word. Views of end times in fitting with the Moravian arrangement of things are viewed as a non-essential, but most Moravians hold amillennial views. On human sexuality in 1994, the U.S. Synod of the Moravian Church, Northern Province, stated that the Moravian Church is not agreed on the question of the acceptability of homosexual practice, and in May of 2014, they approved the proposal to allow the ordination of celibate or married gay and lesbian ministers. In 2016, Unity Synod declared, Christian marriage in the Moravian Church is between a man and a woman, and Unity Synod 2016 declares to the American Northern Province that the actions of its June 2014 Synod concerning the marriage of same-gender couples and the ordination of homosexual people is not in accordance with the 2016 Unity Synod's understanding of marriage. The spring 2018 issue of The Hinge particularly covered the topic of homosexuality. Craig Atwood, the editor, led off the discussion by saying, This issue required special treatment because of its subject. Homosexuality has proven to be a divisive issue in many denominations, and the Moravian Church is no exception. It is tempting to ignore this issue and pretend it will not affect us as a church, but that is no longer possible. The legal and social settings of Moravian congregations vary greatly from region to region. Therefore, the pastoral and theological issues related to sexuality vary from region to region. Moravians around the world may be united in our love for the lamb once slain, but not by our views on sexuality, especially our views on homosexuality. Some of the differences in the Moravian unity reflect different attitudes and laws in our different countries and cultures. Atwood also wrote the main article in the journal titled, while the fuss, the Moravian discussion of homosexuality and historical context. Some of what was said includes, The Apostle Paul exerted more influence on early Christian teaching related to marriage and sexuality than Jesus. Like Jesus and most of the original disciples, Paul remained single even though he was a devout Jew. In one of his letters to the Corinthians, Paul urged his followers to be celibate like him rather than be bound in marriage. He accepted the fact that most people do not have the gift of celibacy, and so he suggested that weak people should marry rather than burn with unrequited sexual desire. There is little doubt that Paul was opposed to sex between men, but the truth is that he was not very happy with the idea of sex between men and women either. He believed that sexual intercourse binds one person to another rather than binding them to Christ. Paul told the Corinthians that they should not be yoked with unbelievers and implied that they should divorce a spouse who rejected the gospel. To my knowledge, the church never adopted that policy. Since same-sex marriage was illegal in the Roman Empire, it is unlikely that Paul even considered the possibility of homosexual monogamous marriage such as practiced in some churches today. It was Catholic bishops and teachers, the church fathers, in the first four centuries who codified the church's teachings on sex, marriage, adultery, and fornication. They used the Bible and Greek philosophy, especially Stoicism, in determining what sexual acts were immoral. In May 2018, the Southern Province Synod approved a resolution allowing gay and lesbian ministers to marry. At the time, Minister David Guthrie said, We have not had restrictions about gay and lesbian members being ordained. Prior to this decision, they would have been expected to be single and celibate. This synod's decision would allow them, along with all members, to be married. 
In contrast, other provinces have not changed their teaching on this issue. For example, the province of the church in Czechia says, We distinguish between whether a person experiences same-sex sexual attraction, which we do not consider a sin in itself, and whether he also practices homosexuality, which we see from a biblical point of view as clearly sinful. Marriage is a union of one man and one woman that must be publicly declared, leaving the parents, permanently sealed, the man clinging to his wife, and physically shared. They become one flesh. Scripture does not present any other kind of marriage or intercourse. According to scripture, homosexual behavior is a consequence of the fall and is contrary to the natural order. As such, it is sinful and reprehensible. Only two practices of sexual life are compatible with God's word, living in marriage or maintaining sexual purity and abstinence. On divorce, the church order says, The Unitas Fratrum, honoring the example and injunction of our Lord, acknowledges the responsibility of dealing compassionately and redemptively with human frailty and sin in every area of life, including failure in the marriage state. Therefore, in every case where action is taken in regard to divorced persons, the Unitas Fratrum urges upon its pastors and congregations the need to make every effort to avoid both a rigid legalism and an irresponsible abuse in the discharge of this sacred responsibility. On abortion, there is no worldwide Moravian position. The northern province in the U.S. stated in 1970, The Bible does not speak directly to the issues of abortion, and neither condemns or condones the act. And since the Moravian Church has maintained a position of refraining from being dogmatic when a biblical position is not clear, therefore be it resolved that this synod affirm that the decision to interrupt a pregnancy, consistent within the time limit recognized by the medical profession, be the responsibility of the individuals involved based on her interpretation of Christianity. Christian teaching. In 1974, they said, We believe that abortion should not be used as a method of birth control nor a means of controlling population. On worship style, as mentioned, the church considers this a non-essential. The North American church says that they are liturgical, but congregations have freedom to develop own style of worship. MoravianArchives.org says, The Moravian church is a liturgical church, meaning we observe the festivals of the worldwide Christian church with appropriate services, starting with the beginning of the church year, the first Sunday of Advent. In addition, we observe memorial days that are of special significance to the history and spiritual life of the Moravian church. Moravians today differ on whether a person should drink alcohol. Alcohol. In America, most Moravians do not teach abstinence from alcohol. The Eastern West Indies province said in a 2007 post online, As Moravians who ought to be children of God, alcohol and cigarettes ought not to be a part of our diet. Churches may or may not teach on a concept of tithing. Of church polity, the North American Church's website says they have conferential government, synods, provincial elders conference, local boards. The church order says all provinces are linked together in a constitutional form of government. Each province, which is governed by a synod, orders its own affairs and holds and administers its property independently, but subject to the general principles which set the standard for the whole unitas fratrum in constitution, doctrine, and the life of the individual congregation. Within the boundaries of a single local congregation, the church may sometimes be divided even further into subgroups called choirs. In explaining this traditional practice, the website of the East Indies province says, the membership of the congregation was divided into groups called choirs. They were grouped according to sex, age, and condition. Groups of widowers, widows, married people, single men, single women, older boys, older girls, little boys, and little girls. The basic purpose of each group was to disciple its membership into mature Christians, fulfilling the call of God on their lives. It helped to keep each member of the choir accountable and active in the work of the church. It built camaraderie and fellowship and made the church warmer. This division into choirs is not practiced in most churches today, but still appears in others. Moravian Seminary says, The constituted orders of the ministry in the Moravian Church are those of deacons, presbyters, and bishops. Those who are ordained are authorized to administer the sacraments in the Moravian Church. This ministry of the ordained is an expression of the ministry of the whole people of God and a response to the calling gifts of Christ to his chief elder of the church and its ministry. The orders are expressions of service rather than rank. Only one is recognized as having authority in himself. Jesus the Christ, who also served. The office of bishop represents the vital unity of the church and the continuity of the church's ministry. Although the unity does not place emphasis on any mechanical transmission of the apostolic succession, the office and function of a bishop is valid throughout the unity as a whole. Only bishops have the right to ordain or to consecrate to the various orders of the ministry, but only when they are commissioned to do so by a provincial board or synod. Ministers that come into the Moravian Church, however, without Episcopal ordination, are not required to obtain it.
Congregations choose to call their own pastors through their boards of elders and trustees. Unity Synod in 1957 gave permission for provinces to ordain women. The 1981 Unity Synod stated, All of God's people, whether male or female, are equal. This means that persons feeling a call to ordained ministry of the Moravian Church shall be given equal consideration without reference to their sex. 1995 Unity Synod stated, In provincial boards and all other decision-making bodies in all provinces and at all levels of church life, women be represented similarly. In 2009, Unity Synod stated, Whereas we recognize that there are areas of the unity which do not afford women the same access to ordination as men enjoy, and then reaffirm the previous statements, affirming that there should be no preference in ordination based on sex. On ecumenical connections, Moravian.org says, The Moravian Church in America, Northern and Southern Provinces are in full communion with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Episcopal Church, and the United Methodist Church, and are in a covenant partnership with the Presbyterian Church U.S. USA. In addition, the Moravian Church is a member of the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches of Christ in the USA, churches uniting in Christ and Christian churches together. The British province belongs to churches together in Britain and Ireland. Some Moravian provinces are part of the Lutheran ecumenical bodies, such as the Moravian Church in South Africa, which is a part of the Lutheran World Federation, and the Moravian Church in Tanzania, which is part of the Lutheran Communion in Central and Eastern Africa. Moravian.org says the northern and southern provinces of the Moravian Church in America, headquartered in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and Winston-Salem, North Carolina, count more than 35,000 members in nearly 140 congregations in the U.S. and Canada. The church recognizes 24 unity provinces and five mission provinces. The United States has three, North, South, and Alaska, and Tanzania, the country with the largest Moravian presence, has seven. The province in Czechia, which contains the geographical area of Moravia where the church gets its name from, has 30 churches, and only a handful of which are in Moravia. There are over 1 million members, with the majority in Africa. In fact, the church in Tanzania has the majority of Moravian members worldwide. In 2016, they claimed 874,156 members. And a final thought on the Moravian name. In 2012, Peter Vogt in Hinge Journal wrote, In sum, some difficulties with Moravian identity become clear just by looking at semantics. We are faced with a terminology that involves multiple layers of meanings and a host of references. While the word Moravian is now generally used for naming our church, at least in the English-speaking world, this use is not without problems. Specifically, I would like to note the following five problems which I believe to be most significant. First, the name Moravian requires a fair amount of explanation, as many people are not familiar with that part of the geography of Eastern Europe. For many Americans, the name Moravian sounds foreign and esoteric and may easily be confused with Mormon. It is not necessarily well suited to inviting newcomers into our congregations. For this reason, as I understand, some Moravian congregations in the U.S. have dropped the word Moravian from their public signs. Second, the name Moravian refers to a place of origin that is, strictly speaking, not our church's place of origin. After all, the ancient unity was founded in Bohemia. Third, the name Moravian erroneously suggests that we are predominantly an ethnic church and thus contradicts the multi-ethnic and international character of our unity. Fourth, the name Moravian Church is not what the Moravians originally called themselves or how they would have wished to be known. Finally, the name Moravian suggests a degree of continuity between the ancient unity of Bohemian brethren and the modern Moravian Church that may or may not correspond to the facts of history. With this last point, we move from the discussion of semantics to the discussion of historical issues. Thanks for watching this Ready to Harvest video. This channel is all about Christian denominations. Please take a moment to look through the videos and subscribe if you find them interesting.